Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Chai Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Chai Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom! It's great to be back, I love this congregation and wow, what a day, what a baby dedication, what a beautiful uh, service and time that was and I see Grandma back there with the great smiling and and uh, what a blessing it is. Thank you so much for having me. Let's um, open up with a word of prayer. Abin Amal King, your Father, King Tadar Abad, Adonai, we thank you greatly, our Lord. Atan Melech Hamachim, you are King of Kings, you are Lord of Lords. And you have called us for a special purpose, and you have a plan for each of our lives. And we thank you for that. We pray this uh, morning. That the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts can be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this for Shem Yeshua and Hamashiach, in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you about the first trip of the week. I know you're going to study it real in depth later, but I just want to give a brief introduction. I want to focus on some things that are really important in the Parsha that I want to just give a lot of time to. Well, the weekly liturgical reading for Parsha this week in the Jewish calendar, it's a really significant one. It's called Kedeshim, which means holy ones. The dictionary form is Kadosh, which means holy or commanding respect or awe, be awesome. And that's the theme for today's Parsha, holiness, holy ones. So this morning, I'm going to focus on the first few verses of the Parsha of the 19th chapter. Of Leviticus. Now, a lot of people, when they think of Leviticus, they go to Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. They go to Leviticus 23, the biblical calendar. There's a lot, the first, uh, first uh, several chapters of Leviticus, the whole offering system. There's so much great stuff that I could go on. But Leviticus 19 is a key chapter. In commenting on this chapter, Bible scholar Mark Berger said, Leviticus 19 has been of the highest development of ethics in the Old Testament of the Tanakh. This chapter, perhaps better than any other in the Bible, explains what it meant for Israel to be a holy nation. And of course, the call to the holy nation is also found in 19 verse 6 of Exodus. So what does it mean to be a holy nation? What does it mean to be a holy people for us today? Well, the word holy basically means set aside for a special purpose. And this chapter covers a lot of different aspects of life. It's not just one thing. It's a lot of different things that involve set aside for a special purpose. Our faith is not just a knowing faith. It's not just a believing faith. It's a doing faith. It's how we put these principles into action on Saturday night, on Sunday on Monday, every day of the week. As one some, there's a couple I used to do uh, a lot of counseling. And this couple, I'm come, they're coming in to see me for counseling and for marriage counseling. And I said, uh, you know, I would ask about spiritual background. He said, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a deacon in this particular church and I'm, I'm there every time the doors are open and all that kind of stuff. And, goes on and on. I said, that, that, that's wonderful. Do you mind if I use the scripture as we talk? And he said, uh, okay. And so I pulled, pulled uh, open up the scriptures to my read a passage that dealt exactly with, with what he was talking about. And this deacon said to me, we looked astonished, and said, you mean that stuff's not just for Sunday morning? And his wife elbowed him and said, see, I told you so. <laughs> and that actually happened. The stuff that we learn here in holiness should be applied every day. It should permeate our lives. It should make a difference in our lives. It's not just for Shabbat morning. It should make a difference when we walk out these doors. So our faith is a doing faith. It 
It should be a faith that's seen in our lives. When people see us, they can see not just, um, they should see new people. Well, when you're in the side of a new creation, the old is gone, and the new is come to stay. As a new believer, I became a believer in, in high school. Some of you saw my actual little guy, I found a little video of my testimony. If you want to see that, you can do that. Or, um, but when I became a believer, my life was radically changed. It was changed so much that a fellow high school guy um, saw the change in my life, and he pulled me aside and said, what happened? And I told him what happened. I gave a testimony of what God has done in my life. And a few minutes later, this tough high school guy was on his knees with tears rolling down his eyes receiving the Lord. I was three days old in the Lord when that happened. But the change was so radical in my life. And may people see a change in your life that you're not just nice people, but you're new people. Amen. That, you're new, that you're new creations. A lot of people can be nice. It's only God who can make us new. It's only through God that we can be born anew. So this man received the Lord, his life was changed forever, and I am sure that he and I will spend eternity together. So when we understand who we are in Messiah, when we allow him to take over our lives, when we learn to live in him, our lives will be forever changed. And people will see the Messiah in us, the hope of glory. Messiah in us, the hope of glory can be found in Colossians 1.27. It's a biblical concept. And it speaks about the living God taking up residence in our lives. Um, and so in the 19th chapter of Leviticus, we see the practical acting out. The first step, of course, is receiving the Lord into your life. And I'll be talking a little bit about more, more about that later. Is receiving the Lord, letting him reside in you. Because when we receive the Lord, we become one of you. And the Spirit of God can take our blessing, does take our blessings in our hearts. We just need to not crunch the Spirit. We just need to let Him live powerfully through us. Not I who live, but Messiah who lives in us. The life I live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loves us and gave His life for us. So Leviticus 19, so, so that's the first step. The second step is living it out. In the 19th chapter of Leviticus, there's a whole bunch of different laws, and basic principles of the Ten Commandments are sprinkled throughout the chapter. But there's a phrase that permeates the chapter. There's a certain phrase that's used over and over again that permeates the chapter. And this phrase contains a key to being holy unto the Lord, because the chapter is about holiness, right? This phrase is a key to being holy unto the Lord. Whether we recognize that phrase, when we fully embrace its meaning, when we fully embrace the understanding of that phrase, we can move ahead with the foundation that we need to accomplish this command in our lives. To be holy unto him. What is the phrase? I'm glad you asked. It's expressed differently, but basically it's I am the Lord. I need Adonai in Hebrew. Or I am the Lord your God. It's found in chapter 19 16 times. And the phrase, I am the Lord your God, is repeated over 40 times in just Leviticus chapters 18 through 26. Recognize the phrase? It's in the first commandment. I need, I don't lie. As we take a look at the scripture, let's be looking for those phrases. What's the idea? Recognizing who is God. He is, and guess what? We're not. It's not about us. It's about him. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 9, the first two verses. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of B'nai Israel and tell them, You shall be Kedoshim, for I, Adonai, your God, am holy. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Here, Moses, here, here God commands Moses. Now, you may say it wasn't a command, it just says Adonai spoke to Moses. He just spoke to him. Why is that a command? Think about who God is. When God tells you something, it's a command. Because it's coming from God. Okay, so everything God says is a command. He's not, he doesn't make suggestions. He makes commands, right? Think about who he is. He's the God of the universe. He's the one who stretched out the heavens. He's the one who 
who spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, what? He goes, that over here, our hair, or lack of hair, like this. And uh, so he said, he said, um, you shall be Kedoshim, you shall be holy, for I am not your God am holy. Be holy for I am holy. So this is a call to holiness. This is a call for to a holy people. It was similar to the words given in Mount Sinai when we look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim, that's a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. God was calling out the people unto himself. He had a special plan for this people. He had a special purpose for this people. If they were truly to be his people, think about it, they would have to be a reflection, a visible reflection of him. We live not too far, or I mean, I work to live not too far from the United Nations. The people represent a certain country, or representing that country. And they should be a reflection of the values and everything of that country. Well, guess what? We are ambassadors of Messiah. As it says, and I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, we are his ambassadors. We are to be representing him. And in order to do that, we need to strive to be holy, as God is holy. By the way, we're still a work in progress. I know I am. Amen. There's a uh, there's a story I heard about uh, about a lady who um, was getting older in years, and, and there's this uh, new building under construction, um, and she saw the sign on this construction. It's a true story. I, I read it. You can find it if you really want. But um, but she said um, she looked at the sign and said. That's the sign I want on the tombstone. Um, and it was something like, uh, and then she passed away, and they put the sign, they put the words on the sign on the tombstone. The construction in progress. <laughs> and it's finally complete. It's finally complete. This is what we're doing. While we're here on earth, we're working in progress. So, a call to holiness. Uh, so we're to be holy as God is holy, and a call to holiness should also seen in the newer covenant too. First Peter chapter one verses fourteen through sixteen. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings you had formed in, in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do. For it is written, "Can a shame you shall be, for I am kadosh. Holy you should be, for I am holy." So we see that. In First Peter as well. This applies to us. If we call ourselves God's people, we need to seek the divine attribute of holiness. We need to represent Him. Our thought life, our prayer life, our moral standards, how we live our lives, all must be in the context of seeking His holiness. So where does it start? Let's take a look at the next verse. For each one of you is to respect his mother and his father, and keep my Shabbatot, keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. So here we see one of the many references in this passage to the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother, keep Shabbat. But here it says, respect your father and mother. Honoring parents or respecting parents, and they're different, and we're talking about the difference between the two words in a moment. It begins, reverencing our parents begins a section on holiness. The Hebrew word for honor in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, which says, Honor your father and mother, is kavod, where we get the, the dictionary from is kavod, the idea of a heavy weight. Don't treat them lightly. Treat them as a very important matter. In Leviticus 19:3, we see the word respect, a different word in the Hebrew than honor. It comes from the word yirah, to fear, to be afraid. Normally, this word has God as its object, not always, but normally God as the object, that we should fear the Lord. But here, it's applied to how we should relate to our mother and father, not only give them heavy weight, but give them tremendous reverence and respect. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. You know it's like that? Yeah. In context, reverence or revere is a correct understanding. In the, in the context of the 
types of this passage of how the word is used. A child who learns to reverence or respect his mother and father is more likely to learn to fear God. May we as parents live lives that our children will find worthy of respect, reverence, and even honor. May they see us living the life that they want to follow after. Living the life that they want to emulate. May they see Messiah in us, the hope of glory. Now that's pretty tough because they see us every day when they're going up, right? They see us in the good times and the bad times. They see how we treat our spouse, the whole, the whole thing. And so we need to keep that in mind and uh, be someone. They want, they, we want them to follow us as we follow Messiah. So we need to be that example. By the way, a baby dedication is not just for the baby or the mother. It, it is unto God, but it's also for the congregation. The congregation needs to be a God example for that child. So the child grows up and feels good about being in the congregation, feels good about being in the house of God. So each one of you in your heart should come in. Uh, and that was a nice service. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, baby dedication service. But in your hearts, everyone should commit to wanting to be a godly example to that little baby. And so you know, a loving example and one that can support and uplift not just the baby, but the family. We live in a community and we do that. Right? Yes. Yes. So the next statement is the importance of keeping Shabbat. There's a saying in Jewish tradition. Uh, Jews don't keep Shabbat. Shabbat keeps the Jews. It was such an important uh, part of, of my upbringing. I grew up in a conservative Jewish home, and the world revolved around Shabbat. You know, that's important. We walked to sin, we walked to synagogue um, every week. And according to rabbinic law, Shabbat's actually the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. So holy that we, that we observe it every week. Shabbat establishes the seven-day work week. The, the seven-day week. Uh, seven days of labor, one day of, of rest. Nations all over the world today observe a seven-day week. In fact, there's, um, there's only been two occasions I was able to find in history. It was during the French and Russian revolutions when cultures attempted to organize themselves around a 10-day cycle instead of a seven-day cycle. Both of these attempts were abandoned because workers were not able to function properly working nine days. In other words, if we look at the, the French and the Russian Revolution, France today, seven-day cycle. Russia today, seven-day cycle. They tried to change it. They tried to do it their own way rather than God's way. It failed. By the way, that's a good principle. When we try to do things our own way rather than God's way, it fails. In the book of Holcher, book of Judges about that. There's this phrase all over the book of Judges. And they did what was right in their own eyes. Whenever you see that phrase, it's loco, not good. We need to do what's right in God's eyes. And when we disagree with God about something, guess who's right? God. Yeah. It's, he has a pretty good track record of being right. I'd say 100%. Yeah. Yeah, about that. So, uh, and, uh, and he's been around a lot longer than any of us, so you know, I, I just stick with him. As God laid out his holy calendar in Leviticus 23, where did he start? Well, it's the first holy day, Shabbat. There are many different interpretations. What does it mean to keep Shabbat? I'm not getting into that now. That's way too long for the sermon. In fact, that's probably a 10 sermon series. So, a huge discussion, which I'm not getting into now. But there are. Some important features that we find in Shabbat that I just want to highlight. First of all, in Exodus 20, it says it's to rest in Him. Not just rest, but rest in Him. Spend time in His presence. Spend time with Him. Spend time corporately as well. And the second one, in Deuteronomy 5, to remember His salvation. Deuteronomy 5 says, Remember that He is the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery. 
from me who in Messiah can not only remember that, but we can remember he is the Lord our God who brought us out of bondage and slavery to sin. It is in him that we're new people. It is in him that we have life. It is in him that we were formerly dead in our trespasses and sins, as it says in, um, uh, starts with the E. Uh, it does for it now. <laughs> Visions, chapter 2. When you get old, you get a senior moment sometimes. <laughs> so, there are three things that happen when you get old. Did you know that? First is you start forgetting things. I don't know the other two. <laughs> so, uh, we're, but it's in him that we didn't trespass and sin, and now we are made alive because of what he did. For it has been grace that we're saved through faith, not as a result of works that they should be no, that you should boast. But when we think about it, it says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and it shares we were condemners. What can the condemner do to save itself? Absolutely nothing. It needs to be an outside force that does it. So, can I get a water? Thanks. Sorry, I'm not going to speak loud enough. One of these, it looks like they're having a. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Perfect. Fresh water, amazing. All right. So, we talked about Shabbat, but there's something interesting. Thank you so much. Something interesting, something interesting about this passage. It doesn't just say Shabbat. It's Shabbatot. So, what does that mean? It means all the biblical holidays. It's not, it's, those are also referred to in the scripture as Sabbaths. So, keep uh, Rosh Hashanah, keep Yom Kippur, keep Pesach. You guys have a good Pesach? Yeah. Yeah, I had it in three different states. Four, no, no, four different states. Four different states. And none of them were in the state of confusion. If you add that, that's the fifth state. <laughs> so let's take a look about uh, that we need, and by the way, the need to set a time to point them, it should be done seven days a week, not just one day. We should always have some time for him. And uh, so what does time with him look like? How do you live that out? I'm so glad you asked. You have such good questions here. Well, here's some examples. Do we spend time in prayer? Do we spend time praying to God in our personal life? By the way, while we're spending time praying, is any of that time that we're spending praying time listening and being still and knowing that He is God? Knowing who He is. Do we spend time not only praying but listening to Him? Make it a two way conversation. Sometimes God speaks to us in that quiet. Sometimes he speaks to us in that whisper. Do we spend time in his word? Do we have maybe a Bible reading plan um, that, that we follow? I have a computer program that, uh, that encouraged me to read a section of the Bible. I read the Bible through all the way through every year in my Bible reading program. And if I don't keep up, it calls me a bad name. It says behind. I don't know what that is. Anyway, uh, but do we spend time in his word and is that time meaningful? Maybe, um, you know, pray first so that God can illuminate his word to you. Do we spend time singing to him? And, and uh, the scripture knowledge should be singing our private time to him. But uh, even with each other, songs and hymns and spiritual songs, as it says in Colossians. Do we encourage one another in such matters? But also, do we have some time that we just are alone with God and we, we just sing unto the Lord. If we play an instrument, do we just play an instrument unto the Lord? Do we make a joy? If you're not very good at it, don't worry. Because Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So don't worry about the quality of your voice. Um, do we spend time, um, not only individual time with Him, but do we spend time in corporate worship? If you're here, the answer is yes. This is called corporate worship. And we gather together as a body. And, and are with him. Do we um, spend time getting together with other believers and spending time with other believers? Time is an extremely valuable commodity. And do we do that? Do we enjoy the fellowship of our brothers and sisters and the Lord? Okay, now I'm going to stop suggesting and now I'm going to start begging. Do we bear one another's burdens? 
And I know this conversation does, but do we individually bear one another's burdens? Do we rejoice in one another's blessings? Are we truly happy for somebody when something good happens? Do we enjoy the company of others? Recognizing the uniqueness of others in the body of Messiah, we should also spend time outside the body of Messiah, but in the body of Messiah especially, do we rejoice in their blessings? Do we recognize people's uniqueness? Do we acknowledge people's giftedness? Are we living in community as much as we can? These things can be practiced all week long. Some of them I hope you're doing daily. Hopefully that daily devotional time you're spending with the Lord. Hopefully you spend um, time every day that you carve out, that you prioritize, that's on your calendar. And so if someone says, can you do something at this time? You say, no, I can't. I have a meeting. Because the meeting is too much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm meeting. No, no, I can't cancel. He's much more important than you. <laughs> So let's go on uh, to the next passage. Leviticus 19.4 Do not turn to idols or make molten gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Recognize that phrase? I am the Lord your God. Put it in first. The Hebrew word for idol is a real. The root is uh, meaning to be to be weak or to be sufficient. So the while well, the ejectable form of the root means to be worthless. Perhaps the words the, the thoughts of being weak or insufficient is intended to be a commentary on those who worship idols. As we worship idols, we become weak, we become insufficient. All gods promise much, but do not live up to their promises. They can't live up to any promises because they do not live. Isn't it great to know that we serve a living God? There's a, an old Jewish story about uh, Abu Abraham, my father Abraham. We don't know if the story is true, but it's an interesting story. The, the uh, story is, and, and it's a very common story in the Jewish community, we just don't, can't verify the origins, that uh, before God's calling for Abraham, he grew up as an idol worshiper, and, and, as in a home where they made idols. His father made idols. And so one time he uh, was in charge of watching the idols. He set all the idols in a circle. And he took a hammer and destroyed all the idols. And he gave the idol to the big one, the hammer to the big one. When his parents came back, they said, What happened to all the idols? And they, he pointed to the big idol and said, He did it. <laughs> What's the point? The point, well, first of all, Abraham knew better. But idols can't do anything. They can't do anything for us. They can't do anything with us. They don't have ears that they have ears, but the ears can't hear. They have hands, but the hands can't uh, do anything. They have feet, but the feet can't work. They have a mouth, and the mouth can't speak. We serve a living God who can do something. Not only can he do something, when he speaks, what happens? He spoke the world into existence. We serve an awesome God. We serve one that can act and move, and in Him we can move and have our being. In Him we can live and move and have our being. Forget the idols. They're worthless. They're a waste of time. They can't live up to their promises. Because they don't live. They'll make promises, but they can't live up to them. And isn't it great to know that we serve a living God? God has no form or likeness. But he can't take on forms or likeness as he did in the person of Yeshua. As he did in Genesis 18. In other places throughout Torah. There are many idols found in the worlds of the false gods. They're even found, um, you know, even idols during the times when they, when they worshiped false gods in Israel. But archaeology finds all these things all over the place. But there are no idols found in antiquity of Israel's God. No idols found in antiquity of Israel's God. Bible scholar Arthur Harris wrote, to represent the deity in any material object is to represent the creator by an item of his creation, and thus to limit him. 
We serve a limitless God. We serve a matchless God. There is none like him. We sang in our literature, who is like unto the O Lord among the gods. And notice the gods there is a small g. Because there's only one God who all the false gods. Who is like our God? We don't worship objects. We worship the Lord. But do we? What do we place in our own lives above God? What do we hold in our own lives as more important than the Holy One of Israel? What areas are we holding on to so much that we're willing to keep from God or to not trust God? In? Maybe there are areas of, of sin in our lives. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's something that we would place before God. If we value anyone or any object more than God, that's a modern form of idolatry. We need to recognize, first of all, that everything we have and everything we are belongs to God. He is the Lord, we're not. We need to be good stewards of what he provides for us, but recognize that it's ultimately his, and we are stewards of what he provides for us. Remember Abraham on Mount Moriah? He was willing to trust God with everything. He was willing to trust God with even the life of Yitzhak, his own laughter, his very son. May God never demand that of you. But remember, while God did not, remember that while Abraham did not need to sacrifice his son, God did need to. He needed to for you and for me. He loved us so much that he would give everything to restore our relationship with him. Because we broke that relationship. He would give everything, and he did. Remember what it says in Yochanan, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. By the way, you can put your name in there. Go ahead in your mind, put your name in there. That he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through God. Where does holiness start? Accepting his free gift of eternal life. And recognizing he is the Lord and we're not. And then respond accordingly for what he has done for us. Being forever grateful what he has done for us and the life we have for us. Living like not nice people, but new people. Living like we were once in bondage and slavery to sin. And he has made us alive. And he has set us free, but free to serve him. And when we serve him, we can have truly abundant life. By the way, abundant life doesn't mean he takes away all the storms. What did Peter do? He's very well known, as every Jewish mother thinks a child does, walking on water, right? He did it, though. Jesus calmed the storm before he stepped out of the boat and walked on water, right? No. He did that in the midst of the storm. How did he do that in the midst of the storm? He kept his eyes on Yeshua. I love Psalm 23. Prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Remember that passage? In the presence of my enemies. No matter what's going on in our lives, may we focus on the Lord and we keep our eyes on Him. And may we live like a redeemed people who are sealed by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Holy Spirit. May we live Kadosh Lecha, holy unto him, for he is holy. He sets the example. We are his ambassadors. And may when people see us, may say, may they see God in us. May they see new people that they want. What is that? I want that. 
may we live lives that are honoring to his name. May we reverence our father and mother. May we celebrate all that he's done for us. And may we put nothing before him. But there's something very important I want to address with you. Group this big, I, I know some of you, I don't know all of you, I wish I did. Maybe hopefully soon I will know all of you. But um, is everybody in this room, have you individually in this room, put your faith and trust in Yeshua? Has he redeemed you from your trespassing and sin? And you say, it says, Yes, Lord, I have sinned against you, but I, but I know what you have done for me. And you gave your only son, but you went slow. God so loved me so much that he you gave your only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And you accept him in joy as a Lord and as your Savior. See, what happened was, I mentioned earlier that God gave what does that mean? I'm so glad you asked. Yes, such good questions. Don't they ask good questions? Here's what you asked. Here's what you asked. It's your own um, how, did, how does this happen? Well, there's a long story written in brief. Substitutionary atonement throughout Torah. There's a whole system in place where the sins of the human being are imported. To another body that is without sin. When Yochanan, the immersion, John the Baptist, sir, saw Yeshua, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the story of Passover so illustrates that, that whole scenario. When Yeshua died on execution state, he was spotless. He was sinless. Is that first land was examined for three and a half days in Spanish spotless. Yeshua was examined for three and a half years in his ministry on earth and found spotless. And he bore on his own body at that time our sin and our shame, our guilt. As a free gift to us, is a free yes, is a costly yes, because he paid the price for us. Not only did he pay the price for us, but on the, he uh, was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead to be you dead. He gave us his royal Echo guest when we accept his gift, his Holy Spirit, and he's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. But his gift that he gave by accepting our sin and our shame on that execution state was not yours unless you received it. So the question is, have you received this free gift? And if you haven't, why not this morning? What's stopping you? What's in your way? What are you putting before God and the relationship that He already paid for to have with you? And if you have received it, may we live like the redeemed people. If you'd like to receive this gift, talk to Jeff or Deborah or Carol or myself or lots of other people. Um, and we can uh, help you receive that, or the person who brought you, and, and we can help you receive that gift this morning. Let's pray. I'll give you more. Can we thank you, Lord, that you love us? Thank you, Lord, that you gave us Yeshua, that we put our faith and trust in Him. We can have new lives. Help us to seek to follow you. Help us to seek to represent you. Help us to live wholly unto you, for you are worthy. May we live lives that bring honor and May we produce Hashem in our lives. May we sanctify your name in our lives. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who is not yet received you as a Lord in their lives, as their Savior, as their Moshiach, as their Messiah, I pray that this that today may be the day of their salvation. That today, on May 11th, 2019, that they may say yes, Lord, to you and enter into an eternal life, because we know you're coming back soon. Nobody knows the day yet, but pray over this round and beyond the way as well. We send you so. Amen. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Yair Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha. 
יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.